Of all the major rivers in the world, the Mekong is the last to have its geographic source identified. Even as late as 2003, there was controversy. In 1994, Michel Picel, a Frenchman, declared it was a spring on Rupsa Pass. In 1995, 1999, and again in 2001, the Institute of Geographic Sciences and Natural Resources Research of the Chinese Academy of Sciences identified it as a stream flowing from a glacier on Mount Lhasa Gongma. In 2002, the Chinese Academy of Sciences Remote Sensing Division located the source as a spring discharging from a glacier on Mount Jifu. The issue is still unresolved and may revolve around which glacier is retreating fastest. Regardless, it is about 2,700 miles from its source in southwest Qinghai, where it is called the Zachu, to its mouth at Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. When the river begins to drop off the Tibetan Plateau near Chamdo, it becomes the Lan Chan Jiang, or Turbinate River, until it passes into Myanmar and is called the Mekong, or River of Sorrow. In 1999, two teams planned to complete first ascents of the Mekong from near its source, an American team from Grand Junction, Colorado, and a Japanese team from the Tokyo University of Agriculture. Neither team knew about the other team. If UPS hadn't lost a passport and plane ticket two days before the American team departed, they would have beaten the Japanese team to the first ascent. Instead, they arrived the afternoon of the day the Japanese departed, only to find a Polaroid film wrapper with Japanese script and the Yak Tung Fire. The American team had already traveled three days by air, five days on Class 5 roads, and four days riding Tibetan ponies with wooden saddles. Then a blizzard caused another day's delay, so there was no way to catch the Japanese team. But they did see a snow leopard, which made up for everything. The nine-member Japanese team was led by Masayuki Kitamura, who in 1994 had traveled by horse to the source on Mount Lasagangma and planned someday to float the river. Needless to say, his dream came true. The American team, traveling under a permit issued to Earth Science Expeditions, consisted of Pete Wynn, trip leader, Scott Sanderson, David Hedig, Steve Van Beek, Mark Gamble, Stephanie Morissette, Jamie Ross, Kerry Ross, and Ma Da. The teams only encountered one Class 6 rapid caused by a landslide into the river. The Americans named it Snow Leopard Falls because they had just seen a snow leopard that morning. Over the 100-mile stretch to Zadoi, where the Americans ended their trip, the gradient average is 25 feet per mile, and the late summer flow increased from less than 500 CFS to about 2,500 CFS. The Zhizi La Wu Monastery, in a Shangri-La setting which can only be reached by Trailer River, was one of the few Tibetan monasteries that the Red Guards didn't destroy during the Cultural Revolution. The Japanese team continued another 150 miles past Zadoi to the town of Chamdo in far northeastern Tibet. They encountered several Class 4 and 2 Class 5 rapids in this stretch and had to portage the first dam on the Mekong, located near the town of Nanchin. The Russian team completed the first ascent of the Zaychu, a large tributary to the Zachu, in 2003. Like the Zachu, the Zaychu flows through spectacular limestone canyons containing several Class IV rapids. In April 2004, Wynn and Kitamura joined with Liu Li of Sichuan Scientific Exploration Association of Chengdu to complete a first ascent of the Mekong in Tibet. Trip members included three other Chinese, Feng Chuen, who was on the 1986 all-Chinese first ascent of the Yangtze, Song Yipin, who owns a rafting company in Yunnan, and Mu Jingpin, a Shanghai TV news producer. The three other Japanese rafters were Aoki Ryosuke, Ishii Konihito, and Masata Kamido. Plus there were three American kayakers, Travis Wynn, John Matson, and Steve Van Beek, and one Australian kayaker, Ralph Buckley. The trip began in Chamdo, and the original plan was to raft with safety kayaks to the Yanjing on the Tibet-Yunnan border. April was chosen because the water flow was still low, yet winter was over. The group had three cataracts, and the, for, for the first 70 miles or so, the river was only class 2 to 3. They had been warned about a 10-foot river-wide drop caused by a landslide a few miles after the end of the road. It wasn't safely runnable, so they portaged it. After this, the river was class 3 to 4 for about 15 miles. Then they began to encounter rafts that were challenging but runnable in kayaks, but not safe for the rafts. After a half a mile portage, the team encountered another unraftable rapid less than a mile downstream and further scouting revealed another one just before the trail left the river. Consequently, they decided to abort the expedition and pack all of their gear out of the canyon along a trail up a side creek to a village with a truck. 
It took three days to hike out and another two days to drive over two 15,000 foot passes to the main highway. A month later, in June 2004, an Australian kayaker, Mick O'Shea, managed to complete the remaining unrun section of the river in Tibet. It took him three days to blast down 180 miles of river that had dozens of class four to five big water rapids. This is comparable to racing through the Grand Canyon of the Colorado in four days. In March 2008, Trip Jennings and Andy Mazur at Picosity and Travis Wynn and Adam Elliott of Blast Ascents kayaked most of the section of the Mekong in Tibet that O'Shea had run in 2004. For a solo boater, one of the problems of claiming a first ascent is documentation. O'Shea's documentation is very weak, but another boater who met him a few days after he had left Tibet vouched for him. The 2008 team is not convinced that O'Shea completed the first ascent of this remote section of the Mekong River. Although they encountered some major rapids, there were far fewer of them than O'Shea describes in his online messages, his book, In the Naga's Wake, and his video, Exploring the Mother of Rivers. In October 2002, Kitamura and the Japanese team rafted the Mekong in northwestern Yunnan. At this time of year, the flow was about 20,000 CFS, and it has about the same 15 feet per mile average gradient as most other rivers as they fall off the plateau. However, averages can be deceptive. Near the border, the river is sandwiched between the Salween on the west and the Yangtze on the east, creating deep, narrow canyons with few places to stop and scout. One of these is Moon Gorge, which has several Class 6 rapids at October flows. The Japanese team wisely decided to line or portage most of this gorge. In December 2002, an American team led by Jim Norton and Jed Weingarten successfully ran most of Moon Gorge at even lower flows, but they had larger rafts and several kayakers for scouting and rescue. Other members of the expedition were Willie Kern, Hulk Dieters, Ben Fadley, Matt Yost, and Rob Elliott. Jim's father, Ed Norton, represents the Nature Conservancy, which was retained by the Chinese to help set up Great Rivers National Park in northwest Yunnan. This park is about twice the size of the largest national park in the greater United States. To reduce deforestation caused by logging and excessive firewood harvesting, Nature Conservancy is helping the Chinese install waste composters that produce biogas. In 1994, Earth Science Expeditions ran a first ascent of the Yangbi River, a large tributary to the Mekong in western Yunnan. The river drains Air High, a large lake near Dali. Pete Wynn and Mike Connolly had scouted rivers in this area in 1987, but since then the Chinese had built a series of small dams and a large paper mill on the river in the gorge below the lake, and the effluent added a new dimension to kayaking. Don't tip over, period. The river dropped about 20 feet per mile, and at the October flow of about 2500 CFS, the Class 2 to Class 4 rapids over the 70 mile stretch were quite manageable. The group consisted of Pete Wynn and Mike Connolly, co-leaders and kayakers, Ralph Buckley, kayaker, Ben Foster and Will Downs, oarsmen, and Peter Molnar, Sarah Neustadl, and Han Chun Yu, who helped row. There are about 60 minority nationalities in China. With the exception of Tibetans and Mongols, most of them are similar in physical appearance to the majority of Han Chinese. However, they each have their own culture, including language, clothing, architecture, and fishing techniques. The Yangbi drainage is inhabited by the Bai, meaning white, who live high on ridges above the river. For the Yangbi expedition, they were only able to find maps made by the U.S. Army while building the Burma Road in World War II, which were worthless on the river. Although some of the children spoke Mandarin, none of the adults did, and asking them where they were eventually resulted in the statement, well, you're right here, where else could you be? In spite of the foam and a huge red sign warning about plague in the area, the trip went well until the confluence with the mainstream Mekong. Here the river rose and slowed down, a sure sign they were on a reservoir. Sure enough, the Chinese had completed the 300 foot high Mon Wan Dam and filled it in one year by shutting the gates. Plus, they were drilling the main river channel near the confluence with the Yangbi to determine the feasibility of constructing another dam. At first, the team thought they would have to row the 70 miles to the dam but it turned out that the Chinese had already established a ferry service on the new reservoir. In 1995, ESC returned to run the mainstream of the Mekong from the Yongbao Bridge to the Manwan Dam. ESC had originally planned to run this section in 1989, long before the dam was completed, but the Tiananmen Square incident in Beijing caused a six-year delay. The ESC team boated 100 miles on a flow of about 25,000 in October. The stretch had an average gradient of only 12 feet per mile, slightly higher than the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon, and had similar rapids. One of the rafts flipped on the largest rapid, 
which the team called Dragon's Teeth due to the large boulders scattered by a huge landslide that was caused by a double quake in 1988. Other rapids were named Chinese Lunch for a huge hole that looked like it'd eat boat after boat and still be hungry. Gone by or bottoms up, a Chinese drinking toast because another raft flipped there. And a mile long rapid with huge rolling waves that gave the kayakers paddlegasms was named the Sexy Dozen. The team, led by Pete Wynn, included David Hedding and Bob Radkin as oarsmen, Ryan Swan and David DeBall on a two man paddle cat, Steve Van Beek and Fred St. Gore as kayakers, and Han Shun Yu helped rule the rafts. And of course, they now knew the reservoir was easy to cross. ESE ran a repeat trip in 1996 so Mike Conley could see the river. He dislocated a shoulder kayaking in Washington and couldn't join the 1995 trip. ESE had heard that the Chinese were building another major dam on the Mekong below the Mon Wan Dam and decided to run the stretch below the Mon Wan before it was inundated. They put in below the dam in April 1997 before the spring snowmelt and summer monsoons loaded the river to its seasonal high of 200,000 CFS, thinking they had permission to take out the dam construction site 100 miles downstream. The average gradient was only 7 feet per mile, but for the first 40 miles, the river was flat, so they knew the gradient had to increase. As they progressed down the river, Yi people, who are famous for their pottery with red, black, and yellow geometric designs, would come into camp and tell them about a 10-meter waterfall, 10 or 20 kilometers downstream. Of course, few knew what a meter was, and fewer still knew what a kilometer was, so the ESC team really didn't pay much attention to their stories. The team was led by Pete Wynn, kayaker, and included David Hedding and Mike Wynn as oarsmen, Ralph Buckley, Steve Van Beek, and Kentucky Phone as kayakers, with Ken Gentry, Mark Holliday, and Ma Da helping to row. When they rounded a bend halfway to the takeout and saw the Dao Shao Shan Dam site, they realized there was a possibility the Chinese would abort their trip if they landed, so they ignored the guy who drove down and tried to wave them over. They passed the huge intakes that were currently diverting a third of the river and would divert the entire river in a few months when the dam foundation was being built. Then, just as the diverted river rejoined the main stream, the team encountered a major rapid and was forced to stop and scout. Fortunately, neither raft flipped, only one kayaker went for a swim, and miraculously, the Chinese just cheered and waved them on. For the next several days, the team ran one huge rapid after another, with names such as Red Bottom, Horse and Pig, and No Exit. By the time they reached their last camp, they wondered if they would have to row uphill to reach the takeout at the Jingyu Lingtong Bridge. Here they were met by Ma Nan, an English-speaking plant microbiologist. She married David Hedig a few years later. In July 2004, Australian Mick O'Shea kayaked from the Jingu Lincoln Bridge to the Myanmar border. The upper 40 miles of this section were the only remaining unrun stretch of the Mekong in China. After the last rapid, the river flows through the Zhishuan Bana Wildlife Preserve, where motorized boats have been taking tourists to view rainforest wildlife for over two decades. The Dao Shaoshan Dam was completed in 2003 and the reservoir was nearly full in 2004. The Chinese planned to complete seven major dams on the Mekong and western Yunnan by 2018, flooding about 400 miles of river to produce as much power as all of the major dams operated by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in the western USA. The Chinese are desperate to develop energy resources to provide for the explosive growth of their economy since the fall of communism 20 years ago. The land area of China is about the same as that of the U.S., including Alaska, but they have four times the population, and now that the fetters of communism have been released, their productivity is skyrocketing. Like the Tibetan Plateau, Western Yunnan is one of the most seismically active regions of our planet. There have been ten large quakes during the past 75 years. Two of them struck within ten minutes of each other in 1988, causing the landslide that formed Dragon Teeth Rapids that ESC ran in 1995 and 1996. Geologists believe these quakes are related to India's collision with Asia. India has penetrated 1,000 miles into Asia and some of the displaced crust has been shifted east and southeastward along faults with hundreds of miles of horizontal displacement, forming the bulge of eastern China and the Indochina Peninsula. Seems like a pretty risky area to be constructing seven major dams, but to the Chinese it's less risky than building huge cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles on the San Andreas Fault. One can only hope a large quake doesn't cause a collapse of one or more of these major dams, resulting in a devastating flood in Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand.